Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. It's sometimes really hard as we get up in the morning and we begin to face our day thinking about the things that are ahead of us and behind us, but never where we really are at the moment. Sometimes there are bills to pay, phone calls to make, or people that we need to make that maybe just don't settle within our day, something that we really look forward to. But then there are those moments that time seems to stand still and we find ourselves in complete bliss. And We try to wonder, how do we maintain such a consistent, happy way of living? On the program today, we're going to be talking about just this very thing, about how we can reclaim our happiness. In fact, that is the title of the book of our guest today. Nicola Phoenix is going to be talking with us about reclaiming happiness. It's eight strategies for authentic life and greater peace. And I'd like to welcome to the Beyond 50 radio program today, our guest, Ms. Nicola Phoenix. Nicola, thank you for joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, it's certainly a pleasure to have a kindred spirit when it comes to being in radio. Tell us about that. Oh, well, I, I, the show that I do on um, Spirit Quest Radio is all about exactly what you're doing, you know, bringing everybody's perspective in all its variety and different ways just to help us feel better. So whether it be meditation or whether somebody be doing channeling or whether someone like me talking more about the way I work, we're all helping people in our own way and collectively big difference. Now, did you find that, uh, because I know that one of the many things that you do was, uh, uh, as uh, a teacher is that you actually teach yoga. Did you kind of squeeze a lot of that unhappiness out of you as you were going about that? Oh, definitely. I mean, when I'm working with my students, even if they're in a movement, I always say to them, you know, where is your mind at this moment? Is it in the supermarket with what you have to buy? Or is it in the present moment enjoying being in the class? Because it's amazing the amount of people that spend time in a class or doing something nourishing for themselves, yet in their mindset are really going over whether it be bills to pay or picking up the children, which isn't even for another four hours. Mm -hmm. Now, what was it for you that uh, as you began this quest of trying to find true bliss on a, on a more consistent basis. I mean, there are days that we have that are great, we're in a good mood, everything seems to be just clicking, and then it seems that we have more of these more inconsistent and long periods where we're kind of down and out about ourselves. What was it for you that kind of really changed things where you found to have more consistency and, and happiness and things working out? I think it was when I actually discovered I was in control of choosing what my thoughts would do. So for many years I was suffering both with health problems and feeling really low and lots of self-loathing. You know, I couldn't look in a mirror without thinking, oh gosh, you know, that I could find 10 things I wanted to change instantly. <laughs> and that was, I hadn't even got out the door yet. <laughs> so uh -huh. it, was, it was really understanding, hold on a second, I could actually look in the mirror and say, you know what, you're actually an okay person. And and maybe through these subtle changes, just learning the power I actually had, that I'd say was the biggest catalyst in my whole life of realizing I can actually do something about this. Mm -hmm. You know, Nicole, it's really interesting because you just pointed out it's about how we think a lot of times. Yeah. And, and what's really fascinating is People will hear that, and I'm sure we've heard that for years. And then there's that one moment that we finally get it, and we go, it can't really be that easy, is it? Talk about how the mind works and why we kind of, kind of miss that simplicity on how this can really become effective. Well, if we think about... The mind is a wonderful, and people always expect us to say, oh, it's terrible because we don't want those thoughts, but it's wonderful because it's part of us, and we are wonderful. So I think the first thing is to embrace it, but also to understand that the subconscious, you know, the mind's always described like that iceberg, and the tip is the conscious, so they're those very conscious thoughts. So imagine my conscious thought was, I really feel for an ice cream, you know, or I really feel for a cake. Now, those subconscious thoughts, all the bit underneath the water, have all these old habits and patterns and belief systems. 
And so the conscious and subconscious don't run together. They're parallel. They run at the same time. So even though my conscious mind might be going, I want an ice cream, my subconscious mind at the same time could be going, but if you eat it, you're going to be fat and no one's going to love you. So it shows just how complicated it can be being in this human experience. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about the power of our mind, if you imagine your subconscious is a big sort of filing cabinet full of everything you've done, everything that anyone's ever told you about yourself and in fact a good way to think about it is if you look at how hard you think change is that's a thought as well which somebody has sort of fed you or you've learned so the mind is a very 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 powerful tool mm -hmm. yet however powerful it is because we know we've got that constant chattering and we can choose to buy into that chattering or we can choose to say, you know what, I'm just going to observe it and just have a little look at the themes of what I actually think about. And that, I'd say, is one of the most powerful things to do, become the observer in your own dialogue, your own inner dialogue, and notice how much of it is to do with suffering. Mm -hmm. I couldn't agree with you more. I think uh, that that was one of the most keen exercises that you talk about in your book, uh, the simplicity of simply observing. For instance, you may go about your day, let's say going to work, that seems to bring up a lot of triggers, so to speak, in people. Yeah. You know, and I use the word trigger because I can't think of a better word that really, I guess for, you know, that really says you react. Now that's interesting. You either react or you initiate action. Yeah. <laughs> now, <laughs> now let's go ahead and let's really chew on that a little bit for our listeners. Now, just think about it. Here's your day, and there's somebody there at work that you may just not like. I mean, there are days you tolerate and days you think, oh, this person is all right, but, but you start following those triggers. You know, what is it that you're reacting to? And you always hear, especially when it comes to Eastern, you know, philosophy or Eastern thought, that people mirror who you are. Well, that's, I think, you know, Jung always said that as well, and he was a great psychologist, and like myself, you know, was not working just in a Western discipline, was open to that the East had this wisdom, and, you know, it's terrible, because you tell everyone, you know, the reason that person is really annoying you, what is it within yourself that maybe the patterns, you know, could be similar, and nobody likes to hear that, no. <laughs> but the, re the reality is, you know, it's amazing what you can learn from. And I'll give you a really easy example. It's amazing the people get that very frustrated that other people aren't doing things with their lives or people at work aren't working hard enough or they take any breaks. But sometimes it's just you're getting wound up because you need to take a break yourself and you're not letting yourself have that break. So your colleague is driving you mad because they seem to give themselves inner permission just to get up and go to the toilet whenever they want. So it's amazing what we can really learn by thinking, what is it within your behavior that's actually pushing my buttons? Mm -hmm. Now, how have you found that, let's say, for instance, in your life where all of a sudden you had a click and you went, aha, I get it? I think one of the biggest things, and it sounds so very simple, is I have been used, I mean, I'm very lucky. I've sat at the foot of many a great teacher. And I used to look at my teachers all the time and think, I'm never going to be as good as you. You know, look at you. You're incredible. And the knowledge that you were giving me, I couldn't even teach it that way. And I would look at them constantly from a point of lack until I got to the point where they sort of said, you're sitting here thinking that you're not as good as us. And I said, I agree. <laughs> and they said, but the message, <laughs> the mess, they knew me very well. <laughs> and the message that they were giving me was that each and every one of us, everyone, and that really is everyone, we are all the same part of this universe. There is not one individual born better than another person. There's not an individual that's a divine soul and one that's not. There's not, you know, one individual that matters more than another. And it was the fact that I was looking at this person thinking, you're so much better than me, while at the same time they were teaching me the difference between us. And it really clicked then when, as soon as I gave up the idea that I wasn't as good as them or could never be the teacher they were, mm -hmm. I started to realize I was limiting myself 
just by that belief alone. And it was a real clicking because I thought the more we separate ourselves from other people thinking we are better or worse or different or we fear them or we don't want to be like them, the more we separate ourselves from other people, the more we separate ourselves from our authentic self within. Mm -hmm. You know, Nicola, I was just thinking as you were saying that uh, there was an interesting moment uh, some time ago where I was taking the bus downtown. There was only one other person on the bus. I took a seat that was in front of this person. Okay. Yeah. Got a whole bus here with nobody else on it but the <laughs> bus driver, myself, and this and this woman. So I sit down, and it seemed within seconds, she gets up and decides to move further in the back of the bus. Now, I couldn't help myself, but I turned and I looked at her and I said, excuse me, was I bothering you? It wasn't like I sat right next to her. I was sitting in front of her, you know, and there was a wall between us. And she says, no, 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 you're not bothering me at all. But I, I had this sense that I did, you know, and I think yes. to myself, those are sometimes the subtle things like, no, this just wasn't enough space for me. You got too close. But just think about the thinking that was involved in that particular transaction. <laughs> well, I always get, when I finish teaching yoga and I'm on the way home, I always laugh because I think maybe I do smell a bit. So <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to blame everyone. When you if squeeze they the toxins out in yoga, that might happen. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, maybe my exception to the rule, but I agree. I think it's amazing the thought processes and a good, you know, a good example is love because it's amazing the amount of people that really are wanting a relationship and wishing for a relationship or wishing for more friends, wishing for more connections with other people, yet go through this whole thought process of how different they are, that they can't have the person that they want to have in their lives. And it could start really simply from, they wouldn't be interested, I'm not very interesting enough. You know, the thoughts that we conjure through our own minds to justify being alone when what we deeply, deeply wish is to be with others. So your bus example, as you say, it's such an incredible example because, you know, I agree with you, you're just sitting there, but another individual could think, wow, he sat a bit close. Um, you know, I don't feel I can breathe. I need to stretch. I just need my own space. It's, you just never know what's going on. He else is thought process. Mm -hmm. Now, what's uh, uh, something that our listeners should come to know, especially as you outline these strategies that you talk about, is that first you come to the realization of what it is that you may be thinking, and then you talk about how you divert away from that. Kind of describe that so they have a clearer idea of what's going on here. Well, I think over the years we've become really, really accustomed to the idea we have to climb steps and do stages and you've got to get to the top and it's this big, hard journey. But life's not like that. And, you know, the greatest teachers have sat with me and they say, you know the greatest thing in life, Nicola, about change? And I said, no. And they said, the only way you change is to make it effortless. Take mm -hmm. all the effort out of it. So the reason in my book the strategies are about diverse behavior, because as I say in the book, you can either see change as gently walking around a puddle, which is literally diverting your journey to make it a little different or diverting your thoughts to make them serve you. Or you can be under the philosophy that you have to hire a plane and fly over the puddle and make it really hard for yourself. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that by making a very subtle diversion, be it in your thoughts, your behavior, your actions, you can have a huge difference on your whole life and the way you feel, which after all, we are after a better feeling. Now, and I know I, as I read in this book that you really know this, and that is that all of us are born uh, in bliss. So you think about the child like the beginner's mind, as they say in Zen, and that is to see the world new and fresh with a particular amount of loving ignorance, if you will. That means that when it comes time that, let's say, a challenge arises, that you just simply do. I remember years ago when I was having a little trouble in employment, for instance, my daughter and her childlike mind says, well, why don't you just go back to work at this place? You know, I mean, it's just that simple. 
And she says, you know, I may be young, but I'm not stupid. And I looked right at her and I said, you know, you're not stupid, and that is a very easy solution. But in my mind, I just felt like I was going backwards. (laughs) But she found a simple solution to a problem immediately. And But there was my mind thinking, well, I'm taking a step backwards. I'd rather move forward. But we tend to do that so consistently. So you can see how becoming an observer, as you say, is very vital to us moving forward when it comes to the healing and the happiness that we're trying to seek. I think, you know, your daughter did something wonderful because she showed how simple life can be, (laughs) how easy us adults can struggle. You know, I think we're very good at struggling. I'm, you know, I always say the university of life to me is the most important university I think I've ever been to. And learning how much I've made myself struggle over things that could have been Mm struggle-free, I can honestly sit back and just laugh about them now because they are quite funny. You've... It's like you, you sometimes sit and you look in the mirror and you think, I've just done all that myself, <laughs> you know. Mm-hmm. So, you know, as your daughter said, the simplicity is if you can just look at your thought pattern, it doesn't matter whether someone who's listening in is after moving to a new job or into a different space in their life or just wanting to feel different. And if you can just know themes of your thoughts, which are themes of not feeling deserving or feeling that there's always a lack, or feeling that, you know, as you said, you'd be moving backwards. And in our mind as human beings, we're very much conditioned to keep moving forward and achieving and achieving. Mm -hmm. So as soon as you get in touch and realize you're observing the thought, and, and don't watch it and buy into it, if that makes sense. You're not watching it so you can tune in and add into the conversation. You're observing it to understand that that's the noise of the mind. And you, your soul, who you are, is something far greater than this noise. And so by tuning into the noise that's saying, I'm not good, life is never good, change is hard, everything's terrible, you're buying into that as your reality. But the second you observe it, you start to think, hold on, if I'm thinking this way, and this is just a noise, and these are habitual thoughts, there could be a possibility that I could start to think a different way. And if I start to think a different way, this is the key. Your thoughts and emotions feed each other. If you can think a different way, you will feel a different way. So by your daughter thinking, hold on a sec, you know, I don't want my daddy to be upset and, you know, over this situation I want him to feel better, Mm -hmm. maybe he could just think about going back to his other job. That's the simple situation. Mm -hmm. It's it's fascinating, isn't it, how the mind works. It wasn't too long ago that I was reading about how the mind uses energy, the brain. And this is what I discovered, and this has been something I've seen consistently in different things that I've studied and read about, and I see it emerge through your book, The Simplicity of It. And that is that the mind wants to expend as little energy as it needs to because it has so many systems within the body that it supports, that it helps move forward and function. So that's how we get into habitual patterns, you know, where we might sit and keep doing the same familiar thing because really what it is is the mind is saying, good, you're on track, I don't have to work that hard, I've got other things I've got to deal with, like making sure that your heart, you know, beats, that that, that your lungs are breathing air in and out, that your circulation and digestion, all these things are going... Thank goodness you're just sitting there reading the paper like you do every single day as you go to that same job every single day to pay all the bills every single day, and that you're pretty much on autopilot. As one uh, uh, guest that I had had many, uh, many years ago had said, you tend to become basically you're in a trench, you're a zombie. But the truth is, if you can start shaking that foundation a little bit, making changes, trying new things, you begin to feel that sort of sense of, oh, okay, I'm feeling really uncomfortable here, but really what's happening is, as I understand this, is your mind is saying, wait a minute, you're causing me to expend more energy than I want to, and I'm going to fight you on this. But in truth, underlying all that, it's simply saying, thank you for giving me some exercises to do, and it'll start to get better. (laughs) <laughs> well, this it's amazing, you know. I, it, I, you know, I love hearing like what you just said. It's so true. If we think about the mind, you know, it has an agenda, 
And we, as you say so perfectly, you know, am I, is my heart beating? Am I breathing? How is my pulse? Am I hot? Do I need to, you know, take a layer of clothes off or put a layer on? So, and how do I drive my car? So it's all these things are going on. And if we look at the little bit about how we look at ourselves, the mind only has one agenda, and that's it wants to be right all the time. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> it always wants to be right. So, you know, imagine, I always say to people, you know, and choose your people wisely. If you want to know the power of your belief system, just pick any good, a good friend who you know and just challenge them about one belief, whether it be a sports team or the area they live at, and watch them defend it. I said, because it will just show you the power that we put behind because our mind just wants to be right. So it's amazing how, because this sort of agenda is going on, if we want to be right, it's another way where we separate ourselves from other people because if I'm right, you're wrong. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and if you're making me feel bad about myself and I want to feel good about myself, I can quite easily tell you something horrible to make you feel bad as well. So it's amazing how this agenda of the mind to be right, it becomes almost an identity of how we see ourselves. So if someone pushes our buttons, like, you know, at work with the old colleague, you know, why is that person annoying me? Because maybe they're pushing some of your buttons of how you are very rigidly holding on to how you see yourself. Mm -hmm. Which is exactly the point that we're both making together is the fact that the reason that you're rigid is because somehow you've learned a belief and maybe it could be a belief system behind those things of how you grew up that really you had, you know, it's funny that a lot of us take a look and say, well, I'm an individual, I've got my own personality. You know, those words sometimes I think should actually be eliminated because I think they cause a lot of the suffering that most of us feel. And that is that we have grown up with outside influences that really in many ways formed and created us. But we never really worked on that inner thing that expresses the true reality of who we are. And that's what you're talking about here in Reclaiming Happiness. Well, this is it. It's, you know, it's getting right back. It's peeling the layers of the onion or stripping away, you know, all of those habits and all of the messages that we were fed to say that have an important story or thing going through your mind firstly let that be that you are good enough and you are deserving because that is what you are mm -hmm. at your essence a loving being and you know our soul is the complete expression of this loving being we are underneath everything but when we're investing so much time and energy into what the mind says we don't free up any space at all to get in touch with what it feels like to be this divine soul. We, we don't have any time to say, gosh, what was I put here to do? What do I really feel is my contribution? What field do I really want to work in? You know, where do I want to live? Do I love nature or do I get fascinated by being in a city? And that's where I feel really in touch. Hmm. So when people first come to a yoga class and they sort of you know, have their first taste of relaxation. They say, oh my goodness, that was amazing. And usually people find the muscles relaxing amazing. Well, magic is the fact that they've learned that they can tune their mind away from the sort of trivial la 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 tune it always plays and get really in touch with the essence of their being, which is calm, peace, joy, clarity and that's something that maybe they've never experienced before hmm. now Nicola I, one of the eight strategies that uh, to me really kind of took a bite so to speak and I think this probably is going to ring true for a lot of our listeners was misunderstanding our pathway to inner peace and harmony as we're beginning to talk about and diverting away from disorder is what begins this particular chapter. Talk about how we've came to misunderstand what inner peace and harmony is. Well, we're very much connected by our influences. You know, think of those lovely informative years when we're like sponges. Mm -hmm. And there's many different where we misunderstand this 
peace and this harmony that is our actual divine right to feel this way. So people tend to be under the illusion because of maybe different influences of society that they need to go somewhere else in order to be peaceful and calm, like I need to have a holiday. You know, it's very common to hear people say, oh, I really, I've got to get away. And I'm like, well, that's great, but then you're just setting yourself up for another down back. Mm -hmm. And then when we are trying to quiet the mind, it's amazing what can agitate us. Like, for instance, I've taught many yoga classes, and I said, you know, in, I said this in my book, I had someone complain that someone was breathing too loudly, and it was stopping them from relaxing. <laughs> and so, and, and I, I mean, you can imagine, what do you say to that, you know? I can't tell this lovely individual to stop, <laughs> you know, mm. just, can you just stop for 20 minutes? <laughs> so it's amazing then we start to blame our outside world for why we can't find TV within ourselves. We're also very good at putting it off to the future, so we're very good at saying, oh, once I've had a holiday, mm. or I'll feel okay once it gets to Friday and I've got a weekend off. So we're very good at pushing our inner peace and harmony away, saying, I'm going to stay in a point of struggling until someday um, I'll get back to that struggling again once I've lay in bed for a weekend. <laughs> so, you know, it's amazing. You'll, you'll hear it so often. And read. If you can feel like that on a Sunday, why can't you feel like that on a Monday morning? Mm -hmm. In fact, why can't you feel like that on a Friday afternoon after five days at work? And I'm not talking about being tired. We all feel tired, you know. We all have busy schedules and other commitments. Yet at the same time, if we're learning to live in that present moment, we understand that every present moment, we can learn to bring ourselves back and say, hold on, it's putting quite a lot of pressure on myself. Is that why I'm struggling? Mm -hmm. What if I was to be in this present moment and not struggle and not feel I had to achieve, just got on and did it, all of a sudden lightness would come and you would tap into that feeling of peace. Mm -hmm. So it's how we're living in the present moment, being moment. And it's very, very easy to, as I said, put peace off because not like push our peace into the future. We're very good at using the past the reason to justify why we're not at peace. For instance, you know, I had a real weekend, therefore my whole week is terrible. And it's like your weekend was over days ago, yet you're still holding on to the idea you can't enjoy or be peaceful now. So we're living in a way that is right out of the present moment. It's sort of play your inner peace because you're not giving yourself that chance to tap into it in the here and now. Mm -hmm. You know, there it is. You know, a lot of times that's exactly what a lot of us do. We get caught up in how yesterday was and what is today about to bring me, but never really where we are at that moment where we're breathing in and out. And I think that's where meditation for people, if they even took a shot just to try a couple of minutes a day, just to, to be aware in that moment of where they're at and what's going on, rather than having their mind caught up in what's about to happen possibly, which we can't know. I mean, we can possibly predict it, but mostly we really don't know. But basically, we look at our futures based on our past experiences. And I think it takes away a lot of choices for us when we're not in that moment of infinite possibility. We're in a whole new time uh, where people are just talking about quantum physics, for instance, left and right. You had, you know, books and movies like The Secret that came out or What the Bleep Do We Know that really tried to show us, hey, folks, this is what's going on. This is the reality now. This is the new way of thinking. And what you just mentioned earlier, you know, about the Monday through Friday scenario, you know, this is yeah. old world thinking here. I mean, even with this program that we do, Beyond 50, there are people that are trying to appeal to this age group with that same old thinking of, you know, reversing aging, for instance, as though that's something bad, or retirement, because that was the old way of manufacturing that our most productive years, of course, was our youth, because that's when we had the vitality and the strength to get up and to do manufacturing and labor-type work. But those, it's because of that that we've 
have the results of this particular thinking, that it's an either-or sort of a world. And what you're talking about here in reclaiming happiness is, let's erase that, and let's see that right where we are right now is not only perfect, but gives us infinite possibilities into where we believe we want to be through authenticity. And I think that's it. It's like, you know, being happy is our birthright. And that's every moment our birthright. And I am so aware we live in a world where there are many influences saying, you know, oh, you need to look this way and, you know, good God forbid somebody has a wrinkle on their face, you know, <laughs> let's put this potion on it. It's as if if we're going to buy into that, where, where is that peace within where we're loving ourselves and feeling content in the present moment? Always want to be somewhere else. But if we can learn the gift, and it is a gift, you know, that is why it's called the present. Mm -hmm. If we can learn the gift of being right here and now and opening our eyes a little bit wider to how we can be in that present moment, this is where the magic happens. People so often say, you know, you say about being happy, but we can't be happy all the time. And people say it to me all the time, and I say, you know, I'm talking about being in touch all the time. Happiness is that beautiful byproduct. But the second you get back into the present moment and start looking, as you say so perfectly, with the infinite possibilities of the here and now, every single thing in your life seems possible. And that possibility is your total fulfillment and it's giving yourself permission it doesn't matter the age or where you are or all those things in your mind that have said no I can't when you're in touch in that present moment away from that chattering noise you realize yes I can and that's a really powerful place to be I like uh, there was a so I don't even remember where I read this if you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> it's so <tight>, true. <laughs> now, here's a, what a, uh, an author that I really enjoyed reading, and he used a quote in this, and, uh, you know, it was uh, misunderstanding our personal fulfillment. And uh, it says, here's a test to find out whether your mission on Earth is finished. If you're alive, it isn't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I remember, first of all, reading that, and I was like, Damn, I thought I was over all the challenges. <laughs> uh. <laughs> you know, life and my meditation teacher, you know, and this is sort of 20 years in, and he says, life is messy. Mm -hmm. You know, it, life, it's, the journey of life can be really messy, but yet through each of these wonderful moments, if we are just open to the possibility of seeing the reality, not the illusion of what we're building up in our head. Mm -hmm. We see so much more is possible. You know, but if we're, as you say, if we're sitting there going, no, I can't, no, it will never happen to me, I'm not deserving, guess what? It won't happen because that's the reality you're also creating. So if you think about it, this show, what we're talking about as well is choices. It's like, we really do have a choice that we can make and maybe first learn that there is a choice to do it another way. That is one of those moments in your life that it just blows you away. Mm -hmm. You realize all of a sudden you can take control of the journey. And when I say take control, we're not really in control of that much, but we are in control of where we choose to direct our energy. And that's as powerful a place as we can get to. Nicola Phoenix is our guest here on the Beyond 50 radio program. Her book is Reclaiming Happiness. It's eight strategies for an authentic life and greater peace. Now, I was taking a look at your website, and you host a weekly uh, radio show on Spirit Quest, as you mentioned earlier in the show. And what I was getting a kick out of, and it came glaring as you were just uh, now talking to me about where we are, where we think we should be, and where we're really at, and uh, when you take a look that it's every Thursday, it starts at 10 p.m. in the United Kingdom, but it's 2 p.m. Pacific time in the USA, Eastern Ta Standard Time. So there's all these different time zones, and you think, where's the reality of the moment? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, the amount of times, you know, because it goes out in the UK, so it's 10 p.m., so I've worked in the day. So the amount of times I'm sitting there going, well, I've hoped you have a good day, and then, I, and then I'm like, but your day might have just started. <laughs> and it, that really comes to 
perspective, the present moment, you know, it's like when the London riots were going on and everybody was saying, oh, my goodness, it's terrible, it's terrible. And it was the evening and it was over for us. Mm-hmm. It's like, no, don't worry. But everybody who was just waking up was going, oh, my goodness, everything's happening. And it was like, no, that's old news for us now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's amazing, you know, we can hold ourselves away from that present moment. But wherever we are, it is just perfect. It really is. Are and you on the show... Oh, oh go oh, ahead, sorry. I'm sorry. No, it's okay, go I, ahead. I was just going to say on the show at the moment, every Thursday I'm working through a different concept from this book, so there's eight strategies. Mm-hmm. And every week I'm working through a different one, starting last week for the next eight weeks. So if people like have the book or haven't got the book, they can just tune in for free. And I'm just literally working through a chapter every week, just explaining the concept and giving a few techniques and a few hints of how we can just help ourselves get back to that happiness. You know, Nicole, and I couldn't applaud you more for doing that. I think we're in a time of yearning uh, where, again, as was mentioned earlier, the old way of thinking, the mechanical way of thinking, almost the Sir Isaac Newton way of thinking, just doesn't work anymore. It's, again, you know, either you do this or you do that. And then Einstein comes along and says, you know, hey, nothing's fixed. Everything is always in continuous motion. Everything is always in change. As we talked about earlier in the program, as I brought up the fact that the mind expends the least amount of energy it can get away with, but yet it craves and yearns change. If we can begin to get into those habits of change, it's amazing how many miracles that we personally can create through our own uniqueness for everyone else. And that's what I like about your book, is reclaiming happiness with the strategies that you have outlined do take work, but that's because it takes the change that people are trying to have. Well, that's it. I think, you know, I've worked as a psychologist for a long time, and something that i found over the years is many people come along because they want to find out why. For instance, why am I so unhappy or... um, you know, why did someone treat me this way or why have I always attracted this kind of partner into my life? And and I answer them, the knowing the why isn't changing. No. <laughs> it's, called, it's called awareness. And some people, and it, again, there is no criticism because we are where we are, but some people feel that knowing the why is enough for where they are and they don't feel ready to move forward and that's fine. Yet, If you really want to look at change, it's saying, I found out why, now I'll let it go and move forward. (laughs) Because I always say to people, you're not going to change unless you actually change. Mm -hmm. So if, if you're just searching for answers but not actually being willing to change, you'll know an answer but still feel the same. And I think that's a big key where we we get this very um, skewed mis- misinterpretation about when people see like this or come and see me, although I'm not your standard psychologist because I work in a very Eastern way, I'm still emphasizing the whole time, use this awareness to change. Don't use this awareness as if you've just distracted, because that's just something the mind would just love to chew over even more. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's as if you've got to make those steps and they're not big and they're not hard because in the book you can see there's tiny things that make a profound difference if you can just do a little bit every day or if your day be it five minutes of meditation be it writing down your affirmations or using visualization to move yourself away from the anger that you're feeling inside that's enough to make your day be very different that's another reason that I, you know, they were called strategies in the book because that's what they are. They're not huge steps to climb. They really are ways that work. And the only way I know they've worked is from the book because to do them myself, you know. Mm-hmm. This book could not have been written without all the amazing people that have come into my life who have both loved and cared for, yet also challenged and tested me. <laughs> so... You know, I love them all the same because I wouldn't be here talking to you now had it not come into my life for some reason. Mm -hmm. You know, Nicola, that's, I think, such an amazing thing for you to say and for our listeners to hear is because I just remember a time I heard, God loves his children best when we're at play. And we all (laughs) play uniquely differently. There was always the one guy on the team that wasn't picked to be on a team, for instance. 
but that's okay. Maybe you should be the referee, you know. But that's just it. It's realizing our uniqueness, where we belong in that uniqueness. And sometimes it's astounding when you look at the different lives and the roles that people play and you think, okay, well, let's say, for instance, you weren't Michael Jordan on the basketball court, but you were the referee that decided the championship game by the calls that you made. There's some power there. You know, and that I just remember a particular quote, and I can never remember who I can attribute it to, although when I had Dr. Bernie Siegel on the program, I said, I believe you said this, but I can't be sure, and that is, (laughs) in billions of years of evolution, just think about that, in billions of years of evolution, nobody can screw up quite like you can. (laughs) (laughs) So when I heard that, I took such solace, like, you know, that's right. (laughs) It's amazing, you know, it's through some moments in my life, and, you know, I write about this one in the book when I'm talking about ego, and in my career I had a really huge disappointment, and of course, you know, that disappointment was all in my mind, because what Mm -hmm. I'd done is I'd invested many years deciding exactly, and when actually, you know, I mean really precisely exactly how everything was going to turn out and I was going to be a success. So so in my mind, I've got this script and it didn't go to plan. And I just crumbled. And this was many years ago and I really, it just hit me hard. And then I read the most beautiful quote that said, and I can't remember who it, we're obviously connected in one way because I never remember, but it says, you know, disappointment is the nurse of all wisdom. And I just thought, it so is, because through this one disappointment, it shattered my ego, it broke everything down, and I had to sit and look in the mirror and say, Nicola, as you are right now today, can you love yourself? Because if you can love yourself right now where you are, crying in pieces, you can pretty much do anything. And even though at the time, of course it was painful and it was upsetting because I was shattering this illusion of this little perfect story I'd built up for years. It was one of the most beneficial things that has ever happened to me. I can certainly believe that. I think uh, you know one key aspect that our listeners can certainly also grasp as they uh, you know kind of ponder what the two of us have been talking about here: misunderstanding our anger, resentment, and blame, diverting away from pain, and that's what you're talking about there. And it's funny because we set goals. Now, just think about this, listeners out there. When you set goals, you know, those those marks where you believe once you've achieved this particular thing, and it's different for everybody, that then you've succeeded. But what's interesting is you may not achieve it the way you think it's supposed to turn out. And when it doesn't, you get pretty upset about that. And I remember many years ago, I was in the fifth grade, and I had a, our teacher was a World War II veteran. He was a, a, current, a major, excuse me, in the Army during World War II. And from time to time, he would talk about his experiences, you know, the times that he almost died in combat and so forth. But the thing that was interesting is that he taught me a pretty important lesson. I thank all the class if they remember this, and I use it to this day. When it comes to anger, resentment, and blame, diverting away from pain, he simply says, When you tend to point your finger outside yourself for what's wrong, that's blame, okay? Just remember when you point that one finger outward, you've got three fingers pointing back at you. It took me a lot of years to understand that, but once I got it, I was like, I can't believe the genius in that. It's a I said before, and I, I do just love it. Mind Your mind wants to be right. If you're in suffering... The mind taking that very easy route will say, it's your fault. Not, not my fault. It couldn't be me. It's your fault. I couldn't have possibly attracted this situation into my life. So I'm going to blame someone else, and I'm going to get resentful at the first place, and then I'm going to get angry that they treated me that way, and then I'm going to chew upon it for a very long time and cause myself immense suffering and no doubt physical disease in the body too, which usually accompanies anger very quickly. Mm-hmm. So in order to divert ourselves around, you know, as you say, the first point about anger and blame is to say, it's okay if it's coming. Don't deny your feelings. We're not after suppressing. No, not at all. Yeah, at the same, but at the same time, once they've come out, once you're angry, let it go. 
because suffering, what we have is this idea that if somebody has done something and we're, we're blaming them, we somehow, and I don't know where this started, we get under the illusion by us being angry at them, it punishes them. Right. And that's what you said perfectly, those three fingers pointing back are all the suffering that comes into us. Mm. So yes, you might be angry at them and you might give them a dirty look or send them a text saying you're not a very nice person. But at the same point, the anger and that energy of absolute suffering that is going on within you is a million times more than what you are giving that person. So who really is suffering? And if there was a diversion to be made, it would make a little sidestep to learning that how you see yourself, if you see yourself as that victim in life and everybody is to you, maybe if you change to see yourself as somebody who wasn't that victim, you might find you feel a bit more empowered and people might treat you differently and you would have less reason to be angry at people who you feel do you wrong or, you know, if you're sort of always waiting for somebody to hurt you or always watching just in case somebody rips you off with money, it's amazing the situations that will come into your life to, to completely demonstrate that. So by changing mindset towards others and the external world, we can also just blame society. It would be very easy for me to say, you know, oh, you know, it was amazing somebody, when we had the riots going on and I, you know, I was teaching in central London and the amount of people calling up saying, you know, is, is Nicola cancelling the classes? And I said, well, I don't know. I used to laugh. I say, listen, unless I'm out looting, I'm doing the class. You know, it's like, of course I'm doing the class. I'm not going to blame my external world. If I was putting everyone in danger, that's a different thing. But it's like I'm not going to get angry at what other people are doing because that's just me upsetting my life. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm in a totally different part of London and I'm running a peaceful yoga class and that's really the demonstration of do I resent these people who are just demonstrating their own suffering or do I shine a light and say, listen, we can be a different way and let's just be that different way without being angry at these people. Couldn't agree with you more there. Nicola, i got a question. Since you have published your book, what would you say has been the most profound transformation that you've experienced from someone who has actually read your work and why? I think, and this sounds a really odd thing, time and I work one on one with them and one of my clients had read my book now they know me very well and I'm a very relaxed person in terms of people don't come in and I don't wear I don't wear the metaphorical psychologist jacket and blow them up and <laughs> tell me thank goodness <laughs> yeah. you know I, I, I am as I am and I have a cup of tea and I sometimes spill it on myself and that, they don't mind mm. I was working with someone and I get a lot of texts and, and emails from people who have read the book I don't know, but this one knew me and they said, the reason why I love your book so much is because I know it's you. Mm -hmm. it, you know, I'm not trying to give out a message of I am the spiritual teacher of the generation and I'm going to lead you to freedom. It is the fact that I feel I've been put here to help people do it for themselves. And... It wasn't the greatest compliment in terms of, you know, you can read the reviews of my book. I know they are great because this book is written from my heart. But at the same point, it was someone who knew how I worked and said, this is you. You are working just authentically yourself. And that probably means the most because they're used to me. And there's no airs and great sake of it. This is me trying to almost strip myself there to show you you can do the same thing and it's still okay. Couldn't agree with you more. The book is Reclaiming Happiness. It's eight strategies for an authentic life and greater peace. And I'm certain that our listeners out there, as they pick this up and they just even try one exercise, just that one simple step will create a ripple effect that your life will be different in days and weeks, months, and even years from now. Nicola Phoenix, could you please tell us if there's a website that people can go and visit and find out more about you? Yeah, I mean, my personal website is 
nicolaphoenix.com, so that's N-I-C-O-L-A-P-H-O-E-N-I-X.com. And the book's everywhere from Amazon to Findhorn's website. I'm sure if they just type it into Google, like everything these days, you know, <laughs> Amazon will bring it up straight away. The magic of Google. <laughs> and, um, and it's available, and it's available from ebook and Kindle as much, which is great. So we'll save a few trees along the way as well. So you can buy it, paperback or whatever, you know, whatever you like. Absolutely. Well, Nicola Phoenix, it truly has been a delight to have you here on the Beyond 50 radio program. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, bless you. Like, thank you so much. It's been a real delight for me too. As well. Reclaiming Happiness, Eight Strategies for an Authentic Life and Greater Peace. Nicola Phoenix, our guest today on the Beyond 50 radio program. We also want to thank you, the listeners out there, for tuning in. Be sure to visit us at our website at beyond50radio.com. That's the number 50. Sign up for our free weekly e-newsletter. We'll also have an archive on our blog on this particular show, so be sure to tune in and share it with others. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you again for tuning in. This is Beyond 50, and remember, live your day past halfway.